Thank you, Jay Shri, and thanks to everyone helping to organize this great event today. It's lovely to be here and have the opportunity to present the results of some uh, research that I did for Open Access Australasia last week. Uh, firstly, I'd just like to share um, a couple of photos with you. Uh, this is um, uh, these are shots taken around where I live in far north Queensland. And um, my home is actually on the land of the Uruganji people of the Jabagai nation. And I spend a lot of time on Jabagai country and also on the lands of the Gimoy Wulaburi Yidinji. And I recognize these peoples never ceded their sovereignty or their land and that I am a guest here. And I just wanted to offer my thanks to these peoples, their uh, elders and their ancestors, and also um, extend my acknowledgement and welcome to any other First Nations people uh, with us on the call today. Thank you. So the open access landscape in the last 10 years has become uh, very complicated. And there's now a diverse number of practices, old and new, mixed, and different institutions are um, engaged in many different forms of open access practice. Open Access Australasia has been tracking developments in this space for oh, over 10 years now. And um, there is, to date, no comprehensive overview of how open access is being practiced across Australia and Aotearoa and New Zealand. And there's also no comparisons of practice across sectors that we could find, so outside of the academy. So we wanted to do some research and try to answer three questions. First of all, um, what kinds of open access practice are happening in research active institutions? Is there any kind of relationship between what's practiced on an institutional level and the rate of open access outputs from that institution and also what kind of support is our region giving to the broader global open access movement through supporting um, other in initiatives particularly around infrastructure so i'm going to talk about the first question first um, we needed to decide which institutions we wanted to investigate and to do that we started with uh, the Open Access Australasia directories that are on the website. And then um, I looked at a list of institutions compiled by Cy Mago Journal and Country Rank, and I cross referenced to that with research institutions from Curtin, the Curtin Open Knowledge Initiative. We just heard Cameron speak, and I'm going to talk a little bit from a user's perspective about the Koki dashboard. So what we ended up with was 187 institutions in the region with the breakdown between universities, health, government, and nonprofit. And we had to decide what we were going to look for in each of these institutions to see what they were doing. And so we ended up with three broad areas, um, one around policies, statements, guidelines, documentation side of things another around repositories, and then another um, around publishing ventures. And so each one of these three broad areas, we broke down uh, more granularly. And the focus here was on the university experience. So some of these lesser categories, these um, subcategories don't necessarily apply to the other sectors that we looked at, but this is what we worked with. And basically we did a survey starting with Open Access Australasia members. And then we searched a variety of sources to find descriptions or reports of initiatives that were being practiced by various institutions. Uh, but the biggest part of the work was searching institutional websites um, for policies, guidelines, that kind of documentation for repositories and for um, open journals, open books, Searching institutional websites is not a rigorous method. I'm sure some things were missed. And um, this study obviously only includes what was publicly available. So we didn't have access to anything that was in on an intranet. The next four slides are what we collected. Uh, and um, I'll have to go through them quite quickly because of the confines of this talk. But first of all, 
the greatest engagement with open access practice, as we might expect, was the universities. Um, about two thirds of them have open access policies, which possibly is a bit less than you might expect. Um, only seven of those policies actually mentioned, including provisions for indigenous research and data and um, very few, only three position statements, but most of them had a repository collecting a variety of things and about two thirds of them were engaged in some kind of open access publishing. Health was very different. Health research institutions had the least institutional engagement with open access practice. Um, very little documentation at all. Uh, 13 of our 52 had their own repositories and basically no publishing. However, with health, um, we have to remember, and the same is true of nonprofits as well, actually, um, they're often allied with other institutions, government or university. So it's possible that we missed some stuff because it was coming through um, university infrastructure or government infrastructure. And then this is the government breakdown. Um, not heaps of policies and documentation side, but very strong showing respectively on repositories. They had as many data repositories as publication repositories, not very much publishing. And nonprofit, not very much with policies, um, few repositories, not very much publishing. There was less institutions included here for a variety of reasons. So this is an overview, putting them all together. The blue and the green here, this is uh, universities and government. And this side of the graph is the different kinds of repositories or what repositories collected. So we can see um, there's a lot going on here for universities and government. This big spike here is um, against guidelines. And this is all those amazing university lib guides that we have all been involved in. Uh, on open access practice. And then over here, policies less so. And you can see that the red and the purple, which is nonprofit and health, is low engagement in terms of institutional initiatives. And this big hole here um, is where we might have expected to find position statements or mission statements about open access or open science, but there was very little or none. So the second question, uh, is there any relationship between these institutional initiatives and the amount of open access that's actually being achieved? And here, um, we use the, COPA, <laughs> the Curtain Open Knowledge Initiative, COKI. So um, I'm not on the COKI payroll, uh, but I definitely <laughs> spent a lot of time using this tool. It became available last year. I really highly recommend it. You can get an enormous amount of excellent information for free out of this resource. So what we did, Koki calculates the average open access output rate for each institution averaged over the last 20 years. So we took that figure for each of our 187 institutions and we plotted it against the number of open access initiatives that we found for that institution to see if there was any kind of relationship. And these next couple of slides are showing you the correlation or lack thereof. So the blue here is the publication rate and the orange is the initiatives. So this top one is the universities and you can see these lines are kind of intertwining a bit. So there's a little bit of relationship going on there. You might expect to see like where you have a high number of initiatives, there's a high rate of publication. That's kind of what we were expecting to find. What we actually found was there was a lot of um, anomalies to this. And so here, for example, as an institution, we didn't find any open access initiatives at that institution, and yet they've still got 27% of their output on average is open. And if we look at health, you can see there's a big gap here. Um, health had very low uh, engagement if you're using initiatives as a proxy but they had a, you know, open access output in the 40s and up to 50s and 60s. So that was not what we expected. 
Similarly with government, you can see, you know, here's one that's got 86% of its output is published openly, but quite low in terms of initiatives it's practicing as an institution. Same here for the nonprofits, 70% open access, zero open access initiatives that we found for that institution. So we couldn't find a clear association between institutional practice and the actual open research outputs that that institution achieved. Universities have the greatest in engagement with open access practice, but they actually had the lowest average rate of open research output. Health had the lowest engagement <laughs> in terms of its initiatives as an institution, but had um, an average rate of open publications that was greater than the universities. Government was in the middle and nonprofits, um, low engagement in terms of initiatives at institutional level, but they had the highest average rate of open research output at 50.8. So that was very interesting finding. And while we were using Koki, we um, did also want to have a little look. One of the great things about Koki is it tracks open access in all its different forms. So everything from APC gold open access journal through to preprints or even academic social networks, other internet sites, it does the whole range. And so we looked at this and across the sectors to see if there was a difference. The gray is closed, so that's still the highest across all four sectors. Um, the red here is publisher open access, so some kind of journal. And the green other platform is repositories, preprints, um, that kind of non-publisher style of open output. And so we could see that there is a variation across the sectors and also that they are not just going one route, they are going different routes. So health and nonprofit seem to be using the journal route the most, universities and governments seem to be using repositories the most. And critically, there's a lot of overlap where research is being made open simultaneously through different channels. So it's very muddy and it's very difficult to actually um, say anything really comprehensive about these trends. So the third question, uh, what support for external international open access initiatives, especially infrastructure, um, is the region involved in? And what we did here, um, we did a survey and we did a, 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 a looked at websites of different initiatives as well for membership. And this, in the report, it's a bit clearer to see this diagram, but basically what we found was in terms of individual institutional support, it was very low once you moved outside of a consortia approach. So this highest one at 26, this is SCOS, the Global Sustainability Coalition for Open Science Services. This is facilitated through call. So this had the highest um, support. And, and these next highest are ones that have been promoted through SCOS. So you can see it's this central um, consortia approach that's getting the most um, engagement. So in conclusion, um, the advocacy for open access on the ground in institutions has laid a, a good solid foundation for open access in general. So we've been doing a lot of good work, um, but uh, there's very few position statements on open access or open science and actually fewer policies, especially outside of universities than you might expect. Um, the, one of the biggest problems is awareness and understanding of issues around making indigenous research and data open almost entirely absent. And um, we couldn't find a direct relationship between institutional practice and open output achieved. Uh, but we did find a diverse approach to open access. It was seen across all sectors, so a bibliodiverse landscape. And we see that increasing the region support for open access globally is, looks like it's gonna require a central consortia approach. And all that's left is to say thank you.
Um, Jeannie Barber was my co-author. She's the director of Open Access Australasia. Um, the OAA Executive Committee um, were really helpful throughout this process, as was a group of practitioners that was assembled to, to guide me through the whole project offering help. And last but definitely not least, every single person who has contributed in some way to advocating for open access in your institution. Uh, big shout out to you. And also, not on the slide, but the Curtin Open Knowledge Initiative um, was an amazing resource. Um, this report in full is now available on Zenodo, and we welcome any feedback about it from anyone. It's a bit of a long read, but if you're ever bored, um, it's there. So uh, thanks very much. <laughs>